Isaac Newton was born in 1643 and died in 1727. He was then one of the godfathers of the Enlightenment, a mathematician and physicist who did much to establish humanity's understanding of the natural laws that surround us. He helped to establish such profound truths that the sun was the centre of the solar system and the existence of gravitational forces. His book, The Principia, is one of the most important published in Britain, but almost impossible to read. Indeed, we shouldn't, according to Oliver Moody, imagine Newton as some sort of cool-headed, lab-coated figure of clarity and control. Moody, reviewing Priest of Nature by Rob Eilif this week in the TLS, describes him thus. Equal parts litigator, millenarian, numerologist, moralist and paranoid conspiracy theorist, Newton probed the foundations of orthodoxy and found them wanting. Newton, a prickly and profoundly ornery recluse, was not what you would call a science communicator. So who or what was he? Oliver Moody joins us in the studio now. Oliver, welcome. Hello. Um, the, the basis of, of, of your piece in, in this book is, is the religious thought of, of Newton. How important is that to our understanding of him, do you think? I think if you want to understand what Newton <coughs> achieved in the realm of science in terms of the legacy that he's left to us today, it is minimally important. But if you want to understand how a mind that had this capacity to hermetically isolate itself from the assumptions and follies of its age and pursue these trains of inquiry with this amazing independent rigour, then it's profoundly important. Because he was a, a iconoclast in a sense in, in the realm of religion. He was interested in what he believed was the truth rather than what was surrounding him. It's fair to say that had his theological writings been made public during his lifetime, his career would have been a train wreck. And maybe never he would have, he would have never, he would have been kicked out of Cambridge. Um, very possibly, yeah. There are examples of other people with sort of similarly heterodox dissenting views whose um, whose livelihoods were destroyed effectively when it became known. So, what are these views? One of them is anti-trinitarian. So, this is the this is the the view that Jesus was um, part of God, contained godliness. He didn't believe that. He believed that Jesus was was separate from God. Well, you you should probably go back a bit further to um, Noah, and okay. um, Newton has this very radical to modern ears idea that God handed down at the dawn of history to man a uh, authentic and pristine understanding of the universe and that subsequent generations had only managed to corrupt it. So um, as you are going through time you have these layers of misunderstanding and distortion accreting around the core of truth um, and Newton believed very firmly that there were people in history who had understood the essential truth and had managed to frame it in very kind of esoteric writing and that scripture as revealed was one of the ways in which you could you could get to it but it was hard um, this stuff was was very heavily kind of riddled and was only really accessible to an elect few newton had an exceptionally geometric mind he loves seeing numbers and truth manifested in shapes so in the old testament's description of the layout of the Temple of Solomon. If you have the kind of mind that's alive to number and sees the universe as this great concatenation of geometry, then it's absolute catnip. And he sort of sees these echoes of the formula for calculating the volume of a hemisphere in Solomon's temple. And he sees echoes of this in the way that temples have been laid out since time immemorial, including Stonehenge, with this idea of the, the planets orbiting the sun and this somehow encapsulating the relationship of God to the universe. Did he have a bit of a, a kind of a messiah complex himself? He saw himself as an envoy who was, who was sort of put here to, to reveal this truth and the correct way to, to worship or believe. So, yes, Professor um, Eilif, who, who wrote this book, who's the director of the um, Newton Project at the University of Oxford, says Newton never quite explicitly says this, but what radiates out from his private religious writings is this sense that just as the prophets, including Jesus, came to kind of clarify this pristine Prisca Sapientia, the ancient truth, and sort of scrape off the barnacles, he felt himself to be one of these people whose duty was to reform Christianity and set it back on the right path. So he was kind of the ultimate fundamentalist. You could argue that. Yeah, if you, if you talk about fundamentalism in the very classic sense of going back to the fundamentals of scripture and really starting 
your interpretation of religion from first principles, then yeah, I think you could say he was a fundamentalist. And you link him, you think he reminds you of sort of Islamic scholars in, in that respect, is that right? Definitely. I mean, there's always something a bit showy and provocative about these parallels. I mean, I remember a classical scholar who once said that ancient Athens was, was more like um, Afghanistan under the Taliban than it was like um, the modern world. But um, I, it really struck me as I was reading this book that the golden age of Arabic philosophy is surprisingly good as an analogy to get across the sheer salience and difficulty of religion in an age when people are starting to ask quite profound scientific questions about the world at the same time. At the same time as sort of being still being bound by, by whatever the, the, the faith is. Yeah, and also at the same time as having to politically manage an incredibly schismatic and difficult period when people are trying to work out the formal observances of faith. So you can see um, there's a lovely potted history in this book of the um, liturgy in Trinity College, Cambridge, where Newton was, was a fellow and then the Lucasian professor of mathematics. And um, so when Charles I's Archbishop William Lord comes along in the 1630s and tries to impose this very Catholicising interpretation of scripture, um, Trinity gets a write-up as being one of the kind of slovenly, quite sloppy people and um, they're sort of ordered to uh, put their altar up in a prominent position and stick a crucifix mm. up and then in um, the 1650s when the Commonwealth comes along and you get this more puritanical Presbyterian approach out go the um, images of the Virgin Mary and the organs packed up and put in storage and then when you have the restoration in 1662 you get the act of uniformity and it's like right lads back to the Church of England. And what's Newton doing at this point? Is he just keeping his head down? Is this how he got away with it? Because these writings about his religious beliefs are private. Was he willing to doff the cap, really, and say, I want to be professor here, I want to pursue my mathematical studies so I know I've got to fit in? I think his position put him on a real knife edge of hypocrisy that was extremely uncomfortable to him. And he rode that very delicately throughout his career. Because in order to uh, matriculate at Cambridge, at the time you were required to subscribe to the 39 Articles of Faith um, of Orthodox Anglicanism. And then subsequently there was a statutory requirement that you should take holy orders. And being an anti-Trinitarian who believed that Jesus was radically subordinate to um, the Father, um, he could not in all conscience do those things. So he basically had to fudge it for most of his life, yeah. But so he got a letter from Charles II excusing him from having to take those holy orders, didn't he? Yeah, he did, which is a pretty impressive piece yeah, of political canny. machination. <laughs> but was his value recognised even then, though? He was seen as so brilliant that, you know, you, you, you allow the great ones to a, a bit of leeway. He, um, in 1665, 1666, when he is uh, 23, going on 24, he has what's called the Annus Mirabilis, where he makes most of his most profound guesses or... Um, insights into um, the nature of the universe and then at the age of I think 26 I'd have to check this he's made a full professor at Trinity College Cambridge um, barely two years after he'd achieved his MA so yeah people recognize them what sort of man do you think him to be in the in the piece you talk about his jottings and under the letter s he writes sluggard swearer sabbath breaker shuite sadducee sophister schismatic and sodomite what, what was that? What do you think that? What, what, what were, were they things he was frightened of, of, of being, or it was troubling him, or he, he was struggling with the theology of it? What was he? What was he doing? What sort of man do you envisage him to be? There's a lovely letter that was sent towards the end of Newton's life by his great friend, the the Whig and liberal philosopher John Locke, to a young relative who's going off to see Newton, and um, Locke says, you know, he's he's a very worthy man and you should treat him with, with all tenderness, he's one of my greatest friends. He's also a nice man to deal with and a little too apt to raise in himself suspicion where there is no ground. And the word nice there doesn't mean uh, friendly as it it's would foolish. today, mm -hmm. it means um, quite prickly yeah. and very pedantic. And um, I think Newton was an extremely serious man who did not suffer fools gladly and who had internalised very intensively a lot of the outward um, pietism of his age and he really lived um, this life of religious observance that a lot of people may have only paid lip service to. So even though he fundamentally disagrees with the modern church and all of that, he still observes so closely. He's worried about breaking the Sabbath or, or, or sodomy or, or, or being idle or any of those things. He, he manages to sort of look in both directions there. He can, he can dispute the existence of the institution but still 
want to observe the, the basic principles. Yeah, and one of the really nice discoveries in this book for me was that um, Newton was essentially pluralist. He believed that the church should not persecute dissenters like him, um, <laughs> but, that, but that everybody should be free to um, adopt in private their own personal faith. He was really quite tolerant, unless you happen to be a, a Trinitarian, in which case he really had it in for you. <laughs> Why did he get into alchemy? There's a bit of a black shroud over that part of Newton's life, and it's not really clear um, how he got into it. One can only speculate that he had this strong sense of the world as being somehow animated by God and that matter was alive. You, there's this famous um, alchemical experiment from the time called the Diana's Tree, where you can use um, silver to sort of grow these crystals. and It really looks like it's coming alive. And I do wonder whether seeing the universe as this sort of clockwork mechanism of moving numbers might have motivated him to pursue alchemy. And also you have to remember that chemistry had not yet really been differentiated from this very kind of mystical stuff. So it is a way of pursuing chemistry at the same time. And he would have believed that as in concordance with his faith. So it's not alchemy in a sense in opposition to the Christian faith. It's alchemy in pursuance of that ancient wisdom that he saw manifested in all sorts of... He saw it in the pyramids, presumably, and he, see, he sees it everywhere. So it's not impious to say you can you can discover these things because it's all in the pursuit of, of the same truth. Certainly. There's this very current idea that... and it, it, I say current. It goes back, really, to sort of Thomas Aquinas in medieval times, that nature is a vast codex through which God's nature is revealed. And I'm sure that Newton would have regarded his alchemical researches as being just another tool for getting at that central nature of reality. So he's kind of modern. He's kind of it's almost transcendentalist, you know, sort of that idea of pantheism, the idea of that God is, is sort of through everything. It, it seems weird because at some level he's modern, because you say he's pluralist, but at another level he's um, deeply of his time and also of an ancient time. He's sort of a conflicting figure in that regard. Certainly. I, th I think you have to come at it in a very nuanced way because... Um, so there has been a, a tendency to interpret uh, Newton's philosophy as, as deist, this idea that uh, God is, is, is kind of present in, in everything and that it doesn't really matter what received scripture says. But that's not true. Newton took the word of scripture incredibly seriously. You can see him sort of DJing with all of these dis different apparatus criticisms and these different readings of the Old Testament and all the patristic sources. He really wants to know what is the underlying meaning of the religious text he was working with. The point of this book, you say, doesn't quite do the, what you want it to, that we should consider Newton strange and new again. Uh, it nearly takes you there, but doesn't. Why does that matter? Why do we need to look at Newton afresh, do you think? I think there are two reasons, really. The first is that, as Professor Eilif points out, Newton was, in his theological thinking, very much a prototype for the radical independence and burning away of all assumptions that the Enlightenment represented. And we could kind of do, in many ways, in modern thought, with going back to that, this, this bravery and this willingness to, to kind of take on the assumptions that people think with and, t and sort of sear away all the stuff that encrusts what might be true. And the other way I think we could benefit from looking again at Newton is for certainly scientists to have a much stronger appreciation of the nuances and beauties and subtleties of religious thought and the way that that can lead to insights in its own right. Because otherwise we say science, and I'm guilty of this as an, as an atheist, I think, science is in opposition to religion. Mm. And I've had this debate with Rupert, who's our religious editor, where you know a lot of the great scientific discoveries are, of course, by deeply religious people. Mm. Uh, and although the church has not necessarily had a proud history in always supporting those views, they are connected with spirituality at, at some sense. Is that kind of your fundamental belief that we can recognise that spirituality can be in support of science rather than being its opponent? Yes, I think so. And that's the that's lesson of Newton? Yes, one of them. One of them, okay. That's a good, that's a good place to, to leave it. Oliver Moody, thank you very much indeed. Thank you.